Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar on how to cover the IPCC Working Group 1 report, which is coming out in just about 20 days. Today, we're going to be talking about the, the upcoming report, its potential findings, and how you as journalists can best turn its global perspective and its it's uh, all the scientific findings that will that will come out into effective local journal journalism. So our webinar today, we are sponsored by my organization, Internews' Earth Journalism Network. If you're not familiar with us, we are a global community of over 14,000 journalists from more than 180 countries, all dedicated to improving coverage of climate and environmental issues. And we're also very pleased to be sponsored today by our partners at the UN Foundation, which uh, of course supports lots of UN activities, which includes the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, this is a global grouping of thousands of scientists who have been working for years to uh, summarize the latest scientific findings about climate change. Their reports are a very big deal. And the uh, sixth assessment report from the IPCC, the, uh, the, for the working group one report for the sixth assessment is coming out on August 9th. So mark that down in your calendars, please. It's gonna be a big news event and it's a chance for you to produce a lot more coverage about climate change and how it can potentially affect all of us. Uh, we're very pleased to be joined here today by uh, several colleagues from the, the IPCC, uh, starting off with Jonathan Lin, the Head of Communications and Media Relations at IPCC. Thank you, Jonathan. And we also have Jose, Jose Manuel Gutierrez, a research professor, a co-lead author, and the developer of the Interactive Atlas. This is a new tool that the IPCC is launching to help explain some of the scientific findings and uh, it should be pretty cool. So we're looking forward to learning more about that. And finally, we have Imelda Abano, uh, my friend and colleague from the Earth Journalism Network. She is the content coordinator for the Philippines and the Pacific and a uh, very distinguished journalist in her own right. She's covered many reports, many climate summits, and we're very pleased. Thank you all of you for joining us today. Um, before I turn it over to the speakers, uh, a brief note about how this webinar will work. Uh, they'll each present for the first, roughly the first half hour of the webinar. Uh, during that time, we strongly encourage you to ask questions. You can write your questions into the Q&A feature. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. You'll see Q&A button down there. You click on that to uh, enter your questions. Um, do not, please don't use the chat to write your questions. You can use the chat for other communications, but uh, if you want to ask questions of the panelists, you can write your questions in the Q&A feature. We will curate them and do our best to represent them to the panelists. We do expect to have plenty of time to ask and uh, to, to pose questions to the panelists and hear their responses. So uh, we do encourage you to, to ask away. Um, so I think without further ado, it may be time to, I will, it will be time to turn over the speakers. I will mention one more thing, uh, uh, EJN and the UN Foundation, we are hoping to hold another webinar after the report's launch. So as I mentioned, the report is expected to be launched on August 9th. We are hoping to hold another webinar that will uh, do a deeper dive into those, into the findings of the Working Group One report. Um, on August 12th. So that's a tentative date for now, but we'll be putting out announcements about that hopefully soon. And just a final note, maybe by way of introduction, although Jonathan may be explaining this, I won't steal too much of his thunder, but um, working group one is about the physical scientific basis for climate change and the latest science about climate change. There are of course, working groups two and three they will have their own reports. Those are expected to come out early next year. Well, we can talk about that later. But for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan and he will take it away. Please, Jonathan. 
Th thanks, thanks very much, James. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to take you through a little bit of background about what the IPCC is, and then talk in some detail about the report that's coming and what you can look out for in that. And uh, as James said, there'll be plenty of time for, for questions um, afterwards. So let me this up. Um, and uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, the IPCC was founded about 30 years ago. And why, why was that? Well, in, in the 1970s, 1980s, there was a growing awareness among scientists about uh, climate change. There's more and more research being published about it. Governments became aware that, of, of, that this was a, a thing. And, but there was so much science being published about it in the end that it was in, impossible for any one government to keep on top of it all. And especially when the, the, there were different approaches and emphases in, 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 in the research. So two bits of the United Nations, the, the World Meteorological Organization and the UN Environment Program came together to set up the IPCC in, uh, in 1988. And um, our job, is to look at all the research that's being published every year, the thousands and thousands of papers that are being published to do with, with climate change, and then say, okay, this is what we know. This is where the scientists agree. This is the state of knowledge. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. This is where scientists disagree. This is where more research needs to be done. And we do this primarily for governments, for policymakers, to help them deal with the problem of climate change and to give them this uh, scientific input in, into their policy making. And in the 30, 30 plus years that we've been operating, our first report came out in 1990, and that led to the creation of the, the UN Climate Change Negotiation Framework, the, the UNFCCC. And uh, we've uh, done all together now five, five full assessment reports. The fifth one, the last one came out in, uh, 2013, 2014, and that was the scientific input into the Paris Agreement. And now we're just about to release the first part of the sixth assessment report. Um, we've already whetted people's appetites in this assessment cycle with three special reports on uh, global warming of 1.5 degrees, which we were asked to do by governments when they reached the Paris Agreement. But they wanted more understanding of what 1.5 degrees meant. And we've also taken a look at two big parts of the climate system, one looking at land use, another one looking at the oceans, also the cryosphere, the frozen parts of the, of the world. So, and as I say, we're now working on the sixth assessment report, which will roll out in four installments, uh, starting uh, over the next 16 months or so, starting in a couple of weeks. And um, we're actually just going back to this one just to emphasize the IPCC doesn't do original research. So our job is not to do research, it's to look at all the other research that people are, are um, producing, the research, the data, the observations, and to assess that. So we're an assessment body. And we are, um, as well as being an assessment body, looking at the full range of human activities, the full range of sciences that touch on climate change, um, we are also are neutral. We don't tell governments, we don't tell people what they should be doing about climate change. We lay out the scientific evidence, we give them options, we look at the implications of those options, but it's up to the policymakers, the governments, to decide what they want to do with it. And for our work after the fourth assessment report in 2007, we shared the, um, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize and uh, that was a kind of recognition. I think that's when climate change really got on the map from this people. Just a little word about our structure. So we're, um, we bring together two very important communities. We bring together the science community and the, and the policy community, governments. That's what makes IPCC reports so powerful because they're endorsed not just by the scientists, the scientific community, but also all the world's governments stand behind them as well. And the governments, are, um, they, they form the panel, the intergovernmental panel. They send delegates to that, which uh, 
sets our business, decides our budget, decides what reports we're going to do. Then they, they elect the bureau, which convenes scientists to prepare those reports. And then uh, we, we throw those reports out to review by other experts, but also by governments. And um, then in the final stage, and this is what we're going to start next Monday, we have an approval session where the governments work together with the scientists to finalize the summary for policymakers of the of the report. So it's a it's a, a dialogue between the governments that want the report and they're going to be working with it and the scientists who have prepared the report um, for them. What have we done so far in the cycle? I mentioned the three the three special reports we we've already produced in 20, 2018, 2019. We also updated our methodologies, which are the ways that governments use to estimate their greenhouse gas emissions and removals, very important for the international agreements. We were including work on climate change in cities in all our reports in this cycle, ahead of a special report on cities in the next cycle. And we are now about to finalize the Working Group 1 report. And as James said, that um, deals with the, the, the physical science basis of climate change. So is the climate changing? How do we know? What's the evidence for that? What's causing it? What do we project is going to happen next? Well, the, the answer, not to give any secrets away, is that yes, it is changing. And it's due to human activity, basically um, emissions of greenhouse gases because of human activities. And so then Working Group 2, whose report will come out in February, they look at what are the impacts of that climate change that's happening? What's it doing to nature? What's it doing to human society? And how can nature and human society, how can they adapt? How can they adjust to those changes that are already happening because of human caused greenhouse gas emissions? And then the third part comes out in March. That's looking at mitigation, a rather technical jargon term, but that, what that means, how can we how can we stop those greenhouse gases, reduce them and stop them so that we can prevent further climate change from happening beyond what already is happening? Because we might get to the stage with climate change where it's no longer possible for us or other species to adapt to it. And then this is all brought together in something called the synthesis report, which will be coming out in September. That brings together in a high level of documents and clear language for policymakers, the the findings of the three working group contributions and, and the special reports. And all this will be ready, well, the, this report that we're going to do in the next couple of weeks will be ready for the next session of the COP, the climate negotiations, COP26, taking place in, in Scotland, in Glasgow, um, in uh, November. And the full set of reports will be ready for the global stock take in 2023. That's when governments will be reviewing the Paris Agreement and seeing whether they need to do more on their targets and more on their, their commitments. So what do we already know about, about the, the Working Group 1 report? Um, our reports, by the way, are unlike anything else produced by any other organisation, because they really change up to the very last minute, which makes it very difficult for us to give sneak previews or advance, advance looks. And the summary for policymakers has really worked on right until the, whoever's chairing the meeting gavels it down. But we, can, we already have an agreement from some years ago, the framework for the report, an agreed outline or table of contents. You can find a detailed version of this on our, on our website with bullet points for each chapter. But I just want to highlight for you a couple of elements in this report which are new this time. So there's a new chapter on human influence on the climate system. So what, 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 how do we know what is due, what part of climate change is due to human activities and what is due to natural variability and so on. So there's a whole new chapter on that. We've had it in past reports, but this time it has its own chapter. There's um, another very important new chapter is chapter 11 on weather and climate extreme events and a change in climate. Again, looking at, because this is a, a very exciting area of science where scientists are now able all, to put a number on what if, if there's an extreme event, a storm, uh, a heat wave, um, flooding, a, a torrential rain, to what extent is that due to climate change and to what extent would it have happened anyway? So you can say this kind of event would have happened uh, maybe once a century now because of climate change, it's happening once a decade. 
this kind of thing. So that's that's very new. And of course, these extreme events, that's where most people's experience and understanding of climate change comes from because they experience these events. They might not know about the science, but this is, uh, this is really important. And then something that you can see works its way all the way through this um, report. There's a big emphasis on regional information. We're going to be hearing a bit more about that in particular from Jose in a minute, uh, because we also, besides this list of chapters, we have an, a new interactive atlas about climate change. But what we're trying to do in this report is bring the knowledge about the changing climate down from the global level to the regional level. Because of course, that's the level which is so much more relevant and useful to policymakers. They can't do very much with a, a map of the globe that shows, you know, this bit is, is gone sort of red and this bit's going yellow from different areas of warming. But um, something that shows them what's going on in their region, they can really start to develop risk assessments, build, help build resilient communitarism and, and, and so on. So that's that's what's in the outline. And uh, so far, as far as the media concerned, we've we've issued a press release a couple of weeks ago confirming the dates of the meeting and uh, the date of the press conference. There was a little bit of uncertainty there because of the impact of uh, of uh, COVID. We've had to delay the meeting by a few, uh, well the, the approval session by a few months because it, because of COVID, we needed a bit more time to finish finish the the work. Um, the approval session this time is going to be running for two weeks because for the first time. We're doing a virtual approval session instead of meeting in person. So we're taking two weeks to do that instead of the usual week. We've issued a media advisory. There's a link to it there about how to register for the, um, to get hold of the materials from the report. When, they, when the report is finally approved before the press conference, we'll make them available over the weekend under embargo. So you can study them, prepare your stories without being under time pressure and get them ready for when the report is officially released at 10 a.m. Geneva time, Central European time, on Monday 9th of August. That, that advisory also gives you information about attending the opening ceremony, which starts next Monday at 11 o'clock Geneva time. There's speeches by VIPs um, kicking off the meeting and also how to attend the, the press conference, which will be on the 9th of August. And we've, um, so that says coming soon, but we've actually just issued it, an advisory on how to book interviews with all the authors after the press conference on the 9th of August. And there's some other links there to, to keep an eye on. Um, so our media registration is open. Interviews are, um, and we're taking requests for interviews. There's also in the second part of this slide, you can see a link to a brochure we published about the sixth assessment report, which gives you all the background, including some statistical information like the number of authors, the number of comments received on the report and so on. But that's actually information for all three working groups and there's a link to a video we, we've uh, prepared. Um, so we're, as I said, when the report is gaveled down, which the meeting is supposed to finish on Friday, 6th of August, in my experience, IPCC approval sessions always overrun a bit, so we probably go on into Saturday. But once once the meeting is finished, we will make a press release available, the summary for policymakers, which they'll have been working on for the past two two, um, two uh, weeks, and some other materials available under embargo for you to work on, prepare your stories, which you can then release at the press conference on uh, on August the 9th which will start off with a video trailer, then have a detailed presentation by the, the co-chairs of Working Group 1, and um, let's say following up with um, interviews. And that embargo package, it's going to include the press release in English. By the time we get to the press conference on, um, on Monday the 9th, we'll have the press release translated into all the official UN languages, so French, French, Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, and Russian as well. Uh, but in the embargo package, it will be there in English. You'll have a summary for policymakers, headline statements, graphics from the summary for policymakers. They're also going to provide you with FAQs, which will be great for, for story ideas and just generally explain things. And also another first for us, regional fact sheets, giving you information about how, how climate change is affecting different regions. We'll have about 11 or 12 of them 
at that point we'll be adding to them in the subsequent weeks and months and also for those of you who have uh, who know how to work with data or have colleagues doing data journalism we are hoping to release the data in, in, in spreadsheets that go go behind the the summary for policymaker figures um, so that you can prepare your own figures based on the, the data used in the IPCC report. So you can sign up for that under embargo, but you must promise not to publish anything until, until 10 o'clock Geneva time on the Monday. The other thing that will be hopefully in the embargo package will be a link to the interactive atlas, which Jose is going to tell you about. So there's just a picture of me and my colleagues in the IPCC communications team. We're a very, very small team, but we we work very hard, so we get all the stuff to you. And we're helped by the communications team in working group one, um, so two colleagues there. And the other, the other working groups also have a couple of communications colleagues who are supporting us. So there's some contact details. Um, there's my email there, also the IPCC press office. You, you can use that one. And if you have access to social media, do follow us on uh, Twitter, because everything that we put out, that, that goes on Twitter as well and other, other social media channels too, but especially Twitter. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. Look forward to your questions uh, later. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes, uh, we will be asking questions in, after our other speakers. So please do post your questions in the Q&A feature. Um, but now we're going to turn over to Jose Manuel Gutierrez to talk about the Interactive Atlas feature that will be coming out soon. Jose? Jose? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Manuel Gutierrez. I'm coordinating this author of the Atlas uh, Annex. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, Atlas includes in the sixth uh, assessment report an innovative uh, product, which is the Interactive Atlas. It's an, a web online tool uh, where um, a lot of information, expanding the, the figures and expanding the results, which are included in the static material, in the, in the PDF, in the book, uh, can be obtained. So this, uh, this uh, interactive atlas has been developed by the IPCC Working Group 1 Atlas team. This is around 20 people, plus uh, a number of contributing authors, so I acknowledge the work done by all of them. And uh, I include uh, in the slides my email, so you can contact me uh, directly. And I want also to acknowledge uh, Preditia, who, which was the, the company doing the technical development. So the uh, this is the landing page of the Interactive Atlas, and uh, it includes uh, Two main components. The first one uh, is the uh, the regional information component. Is the icon that you have on the bottom left. Uh, this uh, allows exploring observational and, uh, observational and climate model data projections for the future, for instance, uh, uh, including uh, data from global CMIP six is the, the latest in the comparison project but also regional cortex uh, data sets for a number of atmospheric and oceanic variables. So the interactive factors includes information on surface temperature, on precipitation, on snowfall, also on wind. And for the ocean, uh, is to uh, su uh, sea surface temperature, pH, sea ice, uh, and so on. So it includes a variety of uh, variables, all linked to the assessment done in the chapter. So the interactive atlas is not an independent tool. It is linked to the, to the assessment done in the different chapters, in the technical summary, and in the summary for policymakers. And besides the basic variables, it also allows to, uh, as, uh, to, to explore uh, extreme indexes, which are used in chapter 11, as was uh, uh, mentioned by Jonathan in the previous talk. So we, we have indexes for extreme precipitation, uh, heat waves, extreme temperature, and so on. So this is the, the visual appealing tool. Uh, uh, I, will, I will show on a screenshot uh, in, a, in a minute. But we have another element, uh, 
which is the regional synthesis component. This is confidential. I can't show you any information there because it allows you to explore the assessment information. So the, the final messages produced by the, by the IPCC, by the sixth assessment report uh, about regional changes for a number of uh, what is uh, so-called uh, climatic impact drivers. So it's like indexes affecting uh, uh, or producing impacts uh, in different sectors. So this is the handshaking between the working group one, which is physics and working group two, which is impacts. So we provide uh, assessment on physical variables, but also on indexes, which are more linked to the impacts. This is what we call the climatic impact drivers. So uh, that, uh, that uh, component supports uh, the, the regional assessment done in the technical summary and in particular in the summary for policy maker. So that would be, um, uh, for instance, a lot to expand on the figures which uh, you will be um, checking on the, on the summary for policy makers. And then in the documentation, the third uh, main block, we include uh, user guidance, uh, videos, focusing very much on videos, but uh, we include information on reproducibility as well. And that's, that's been a major uh, focus of this uh, assessment cycle, because uh, since the, uh, in particular for the interactive atlas, because since we are providing data, which is just produced from data, uh, applying a pipeline of different post-processing um, steps, uh, we wanted to have all the all the steps uh, publicly available, well documented, so anyone can reproduce the same information that we have done uh, just by uh, checking that information. So everything is public, is uh, is uh, freely available, and is uh, reproducible. So even if there is some problem, some bug, so that will be there. So the, everything is open. That um, so. Uh, if the regional information component uh, provides regional information, as the name indicates, both in terms of periods in the future, for instance, the end of the 21st century, for, for or across a number of scenarios, so high emission, low emission, so the typical uh, projections in the future, which uh, accompany all the IPCC assessment reports, but the uh, uh, it also allows you to, um, to look at the data, to look at the projections uh, using a, a new dimension, which is the global warming level. So we provide also the possibility to look at the, the future world at two degrees, three degrees, four degrees, and also 1.5. So we include policy uh, relevant uh, global warming levels, 1.5 and 2, relevant for, for, because they uh, align to the uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, Paris um, uh, uh, yeah, the re re regulation and uh, uh, also uh, more um, extreme scenarios uh, just to, to have high, um, high impact, low likelihood information. So the typical information that you can get from the interactive atlas is uh, in the form of global maps. So this is what, what you have on the left is a screenshot. So you can choose the data set, global or regional, the variable, the period or global warming level, and also the season. Yeah, so you can uh, customize the season of interest for your region. And then you get typical products like the, like the warming, or this is the case for uh, precipitation. This is the annual, but you can get the winter or summer or any other season. Uh, and uh, also uh, this uh, another variable, this is sea level rise. So all that kind of maps can be produced and customized with the interactive atlas. And uh, on the top of that, uh, the interactive atlas also allows regional analysis. So by clicking on a, on a particular region, for instance, the Mediterranean, uh, the interactive atlas uh, uh, provides uh, aggregated regional information uh, in a number of visuals. So the, the, by default is the time series. So those are the typical plots with the time series, all models uh, into the future. And, uh, but uh, there are also uh, information uh, in, the, in the form of uh, more uh, modern 
This was like the climate stripes. I, I guess you are all familiar with that. Or this is, for instance, the annual cycle uh, change. So you can see that the, in summer or in winter, the climate change uh, signal would be uh, stronger or weaker. And also um, uh, summary information uh, in, the, in the form of tables and the scatter plots of precipitation versus temperature. And uh, all that referring to the regional, the particular region of interest selected among a number of predefined regions, which uh, you have on the on the right. So this is the updated reference regions, which are underpinning the assessment done in the working group one six assessment report. So this is the the the, the regions where uh, the information can be aggregated and the, the assessment can be can be obtained. They are not the, the only ones where you can get information. Uh, there are also, for instance, information for major river basins, information for monsoon regions, uh, for continental regions. This is in support of working group two because they use those particular continental regions. But uh, we have um, limited granularity. We don't allow to, uh, to obtain regional information, aggregated information for customized regions or for countries because this is not the remit of the uh, working group one um, um, report. Uh, so we rely on regions where the uh, regional information makes sense and can be obtained reliably and the links to the literature and links to the a minimum skillful scale for, for the models. So just uh, the final slide about reproducibility and reusability all the information which is um, uh, used in the interactive atlas, for instance, the, the reference regions or the reference uh, grids, uh, all the, the data sources, all that uh, is being included in a GitHub repository, which uh, will include uh, all the information which is needed to get exactly the same figures or the, uh, to obtain uh, or expand and reduce this information. And that would be also uh, publicly available. And um, all, all that uh, uh, includes also the scripts and notebooks where you can find the, the particular code used for the different pieces of the, of the analysis. And all that is done using uh, open community tools. So the, the, it is all open to the, to the community. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's it uh, in the interest of time, I think I will stop here. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you very much. It looks like a great tool, something I hope many of us will play around with to further our stories. But uh, before asking questions, we're going to turn it over now to Imelda Abano from the Philippines. Thank you, State, for staying up so late to join us, Imelda, and please take it away. Thank you, James. Can you hear me very well? Okay. Um, well, as we know, uh, climate change will become a top theme of uh, media coverage around the world in the latter half of uh, this year. Um, can I have the slide from? Okay. okay. Thanks, Stefano. Um, okay. Next slide, please. Well, with, uh, with the first part of the IPC6 assessment report, or what we call the AR6, uh, we're expected to publish next month or of every newsroom, uh, media outlets and journalists will be expected to uh, report on this comprehensive um, stock taking of uh, what we know about how climate change could hit humanity and what can we uh, do to keep uh, global heating below 1.5 degrees. As such, it will shape uh, global uh, policy, as we know, uh, policy discussions around the pivotal COP26 uh, in Glasgow and uh, beyond. Okay, next slide. And uh, of course, it's, it's good that we have with us Jonathan, who explain its importance and who would help uh, and urge journalists to pay attention to the forthcoming world's most, I, I say most important sci scientific uh, or science report. And uh, of course, Jose, who also shared his insights earlier and na navigated us um, a bit on how to use the uh, Atlas. 
Um, anyway, in my uh, presentation, I would simply discuss the journalism insights on how to best cover the launch and um, uh, the report itself of the six IPCC report, just like the past um, important uh, scientific reports. Uh, well, I, I've covered IPCC reports since uh, I think 2007 with the fourth uh, assessment report. And uh, post Kyoto, that's a post Kyoto agreement to the fifth assessment report uh, finalized between, I think, uh, 2013 and 2014, uh, which uh, provides a scientific input into the Paris Agreement. Uh, and then the three special reports on the 1.5 degrees. Uh, which is the climate change and land uh, and the oceans in uh, uh, oceans in 2019 and and now we have this um, AR6 as we call it which is expected to be uh, launched um, on August 9. Uh, so journals would mostly uh, work from the uh, synthesis reports and uh, I believe read the executive summaries or uh, the summary for policymakers for IPC special reports which is very useful and um, helpful uh, documents. Uh, it's, it's seldom necessary to go, to go beyond the executive uh, summaries, but um, there were some important details. Even the reports themselves are, are very chunky and the tables, but the tables and the charts in the appendices are also useful. Um, Climate science is very difficult and technical topic to communicate to um, a non-specialist audience. So journalists um, turn these reports into language most people with, will understand without um, harming the science. And uh, of course, media portrayals interpreted main findings and um, conclusions in varied ways. But wherever part of uh, the world you are uh, at this point, May it be in the Pacific Islands, uh, Asia, Australia, Middle East, um, Africa, Europe, or the Americas. The, the scientific reports have arguably um, sparked media coverage of uh, climate crisis, which not only uh, threatens, of course, our ecosystems, but it also affects um, food and water security or uh, political and economic stability, as well as um, our livelihoods. Uh, what else? That's why it's important to understand the science behind climate change to, um, of course, as we say, the Earth Journalism Network to increase the quality of um, coverage and to raise public awareness and increase, of course, increase pressure on governments to take um, a substantive um, action. So it, its importance can hardly be overestimated. And I think the sixth assessment report the first report since the adoption of the Paris Agreement will shape the COP26 um, climate conference in Glasgow. Um, next, please. So um, how can we best report the upcoming um, IPCC report, just like the uh, past scientific reports? First of all, um, uh, learn the science. Many journalists have, um, of course, long had a bias towards conceptual but you can't do justice actually to the climate crisis if you don't um, understand the scientific facts just by listening to Jonathan and to Jose from this webinar. So for me, journalists should at least um, understand the, the science of climate change, its causes, its controversies, and um, its current and projected impacts. Believe me, covering climate is, is, is not easy. Uh, so journalists in in ways their in ways um their audiences can understand will find um, they have many more opportunities to to to, to tell the stories. Um, avoid sensationalism. Uh, just as journalists should take care when um, interpreting the results of scientific report, they should go to great lengths to avoid sensationalism in their reporting. Uh, I think while it is of course important to draw the appropriate uh, linkages between uh, climate change, for instance, and extreme weather. It is unwise to attribute any, any single event to uh, global warming, for instance. And the, the AR6 is important to help us describe which extreme um, events and uh, living conditions hundreds of millions of people in the most vulnerable countries are 
to be uh, facing from the Philippines, where I am now, to Brazil, India, or to Nigeria. Um, first, from global to, uh, to local. For a long time, journalists have been pressed to, to find local angle to their stories. Um, such examples are um, interactive maps on how, for instance, Asian uh, cities will be affected by sea level rise. And of course, thanks to, to Jose for uh, giving us a glimpse on how to best use the, the Atlas in our uh, reporting. And we're looking forward uh, to that. And uh, of course, uh, we need to uh, report what is relevant to our countries, to our people or communities around us. Uh, okay, next. Um, uh, yeah, use different angles. Um, even sources, um, remember that climate change is not just an environment or science story. It's also political, uh, business, sports, um, human rights, um, energy and technology uh, stories. So look into all these um, uh, different angles and pitch them to uh, maybe to different um, editors anchoring on um, the assessment of report especially expanding the uh, initial findings of the AR6 of the UN um, climate talks uh, and using different angles. Um, well, uh, we all know this to connect uh, our stories to people, places, or uh, wildlife. Um, and then this is, uh, this is something new for me. Um, covering the solutions. Um, I think there isn't a more um, exciting time to be on the climate bit. And that may be sound um, strange considering how much suffering lies in store from the impacts that are um, already locked in. So journalists have um, a harder time with solutions to a problem. And now that with uh, climate change, I think the solution is a critical part of um, the story. It's just keeping, uh, faith with uh, the basic mandate of news to uh, provide an objective, accurate, and I think um, useful description of the world in which uh, we live. Um, and there's there's the access to IPCC resources where we have Jonathan here and Jose, um, and of course the communication team. And then many help, there are many helpful uh, resources from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, reporting tips from reputable um, news or media development organizations like the Earth Journalism Network. So just like what Jonathan, Jonathan said, uh, register and be credited to um, access materials before the actual date of release of the report to, to access the um, press conference, of course. And of course, do visit the Air Journalism Net, that net uh, and access its vast resources to strengthen your skills on uh, reporting climate change and other environmental issues. Uh, do I still have a slide? Um, okay. And lastly, since I mentioned EJN, uh, we aim to bring this year about 20 journalists from developing country to report uh, uh, in person at COP26 in Glasgow um, under our uh, CCMP program. So we will, not, uh, we will not only cover the international climate negotiations, but to also help journalists gain more um, knowledge in uh, understanding actions uh, countries are taking or not taking to address climate change impacts and enhance, enhance their skills in reporting uh, scientific reports such as the uh, a six assessment report as they apply it to their uh, local audiences. Anyway, I know James will uh, expound a bit about CCMP later on. So thank you for this um, opportunity. Thank you, Imelda, great stuff there. And yes, as Imelda says, I mean, this is a big story. This is, uh, you know, uh, we, we at the Earth Journalism Network, we believe this is gonna be the biggest story of the century. Uh, so take the time to understand the science, you know, look at the report, especially the executive summary, the summary for policymakers, that's what it's there for, you know, and, uh, and, and you can, you can, you can make a, a career essentially out of this because it's such a big story. It's going to affect 
all of humanity, all of society and the world around us. So uh, this is a great opportunity to learn more about it and, and how to report on it. So now we're gonna ask some questions of our panelists. And just a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A feature, don't be shy. Uh, there's uh, no such thing as a stupid question. We, we do welcome all, all your questions. So, but I'm gonna begin. Uh, I want, I'd like to ask Jonathan, but really all the panelists, if, if, you're, if you'd like to respond, Jonathan is someone who has, you know, been working on these reports for a long time. You've seen, you've seen the science evolve. Um, and I, I'm not, we know you can't talk about what's in the latest report, but is it your impression th that uh, the impacts of climate change have come on faster, more severe? than perhaps we initially thought, you know, many years ago when as the IPCC was was forming and producing its early reports. It's just it's certainly my impression. And for many of us, I know it seems like, you know, we've been struck at how, you know, the extreme weather events and, and other uh, impacts of climate change seemed to be coming on even quicker and, and more severe than perhaps uh, than perhaps we predicted. We, Care to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. And it's, I'm not talking here then as a scientist, but more just as a sort of the way I, I sort of see how things have gone. And I mean, I think when I started 10 years ago, climate change for many people was still something that was very remote, remote in the future or remote from where they, they, where they lived. And of course, there were terrible natural disasters. The, the, the Philippines, in fact, is one country in particular that seems almost every year to have a terrible climate-related disaster. But, but still, but what we've seen over, over the years is it's just starting to happen everywhere. So there was that, that Hurricane Sandy in, in New York, you know, one of the richest places in the world. It's not just a phenomenon in poor countries, developing countries. It's happening in rich. Look at look at what's going on in Europe now. Germany, um, terrible flooding there, and some really um, almost um, you know um, ap apocalyptic things like last year or the year before, the Arctic was on fire. All the forests of Siberia were burning, and it's just. So I think I my impression is it is. It is kind of speeding up and happening faster and what was seemed like a problem for the next generation it's now now it's with us but that i would say <laughs> there's a sort of silver lining in that at least people have sort of woken up to it and un understand it and there's the, the sort of calls for for action and i think what you're going to see in this i mean we'll get, we'll get into the impacts of climate change in the next report in february and some of that has already been uh, leaked a couple of weeks ago, but that's not the final version. So don't take that too, but it gives you a flavor of the sort of things that are being said. But I think what this report is gonna, is gonna be a real wake up call to people because I think a lot of people sat up when our 1.5 degree report came out in 2018. That really made people understand what's going on. But since 2018, we've had three years of more science so we have a better understanding now than we did even three years ago of what's been causing warming in the past, how much warming there's been, the data has improved, better idea of projections for the future. We've had three intervening years of record, near record heat. And um, yeah, so this is going to, I think this is really just going to, this report and the next one are really going to bring it home to people how, how fast it's happening and how much needs to be done. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, it may be the fact that uh, the the policymakers pretty much recalibrated their target from two degrees of warming to 1.5 degrees because they saw, we all saw that the impacts of climate change are coming on more quickly than even we expected. Jose, Mimelda, do you want to respond to this at all or should we move on to the next question? You're okay. Um, Jose, we do have a question for you. Is the atlas going to be released on August 9th as well? Yeah, the regional information component will be will be out uh, on August, but the regional synthesis will uh, undergo for, and with an, an additional editing uh, just to update and uh, synchronize the contents with the latest version after the approval. So there is no uh, time to have the, that component ready uh, 
in just after the approval. So we'll go into steps. The first step with the with the rest of the material will go in August 9. This will be the regional information, the interactive application to uh, the visual appealing one, and then the uh, the regional synthesis will will be released in uh, in late September, most likely in a in a press conference from from Spain. Uh, but that will be announced uh, afterwards. Um, so there's a question from Joy D. Gupta about <clears throat> kind of the level of specificity we can get down to in the report on, on the regions. It looked like, Jose, from your representation that it's not quite at the country level, uh, but rather there, it, the world is being divided into regions to talk about uh, science. Is, is that correct? And can you talk about yeah. maybe you and Jonathan talk about the level of specificity for regional analysis? Yeah. Yeah, actually, when um, when we had the scoping conference for the Atlas, the Atlas uh, was intended to be uh, static, to be maps. So we started to think on interactivity. And there were a number of uh, alarms uh, raised uh, with the with the potential problem of um, producing information which is not reliable. So if you just go very local uh, and you, with the data alone, you will produce uh, regional information, but this uh, doesn't need to be reliable. So uh, we needed to limit the, the granularity of the, of the interactive atlas. So it would, be, it would have been very easy to develop the interactive atlas so the regions can be customized, but we just uh, disabled that possibility uh, to guarantee that the products that we release uh, have uh, enough scientific uh, confidence. So we uh, developed a new set of reference regions, which uh, are the smallest regions where a consistent assessment can be made based not only on the models, but on other lines of evidence, the literature, the papers, and so on and so forth. And that those reference regions are the minimum, um, the subcontinental sub scale uh, at which the, the assessment uh, is performed in the, in the six assessment report. So regional means uh, subcontinental for the assessment report. It doesn't go down to the country or even, uh, even deeper. Great, and one more question about the Atlas, Jose, while we're on the topic. Um, as it's linked to the work of WGI, will the Atlas continue to be updated with new data and more variables through the next IPCC cycle? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, everything is new with the interactive atlas. It's the first uh, building the road as we walk. And there are many open issues that we need to uh, discuss and to and to agree on uh, on the fly. Uh, so the interactive atlas will be frozen after the approval, after the, right. the okay. release, okay. because as any other material on IPCC is, uh, is uh, sensitive for policy making. Right. So, uh, and uh, it has to be reviewed. So if we um, wanted to update the interactive atlas, we would need to, to, to go for a new review of all the, all the new data, all the new products. And that, that, that's not uh, uh, feasible. So the idea is that the interactive atlas will be frozen but uh, most likely there, there will be a live version uh, of the interactive factors, not the IPCC version, but the live one. And we are co in conversations with the, with the um, uh, organizations to, to support the, this work, to, to host the live in interactive factors. So most likely there will be yeah, a live uh, version so that uh, could uh, pave the way for the for the next uh, cycle. So the, the next next Atlas team uh, have some uh, will have some resources to build from, and uh, they do, they they will need to start from scratch as we did for this first release. Thank you, Jose. A question for Imelda. Imelda, how how do you find the news treatment of IPCC related stories in media outlets in general, and do you have any advice in particular for freelance journalists and how they can effectively pitch these stories? Um, I think more and more journalists now are covering um, scientific um, reports and uh, um, 
interested in strengthening, um, of course, covering uh, the, the, the science of climate change, especially in uh, the developing countries. And I think the IPCC did a, um, a good job in, uh, you know, uh, freeing uh, the reports from uh, jargon, whilst maintaining its scientific um, integrity and in uh, ensuring uh, to put journalists in touch with uh, the authors of the relevant, relevant um, sections of the, the report, or at least uh, the IPCC authors from, from their uh, countries to explain its uh, local relevance and, um, and uh, importance. Um, just like what I've uh, said a while ago, um, climate change is not just um, an environment or science, uh, story. So you can do a lot of angle um, in storytelling, like uh, it, it's, it's a, also a sports, uh, political story, business, um, a human rights or energy and technology uh, story. So look into all these angles and more and uh, pitch them to different editors. Um, uh, of course, um, connecting your stories to uh, people, places, and uh, wildlife showing the impact on, for example, food, uh, health, uh, travel, money, or, or things we love and uh, uh, are familiar with. Thank you, Imelda. Yes. If you have trouble getting your climate stories through, through your, to your editor, look for different angles. Jonathan, you'd like to say something? Um, yeah, I just want to echo exactly what Imelda is saying. She's making a really good point here that climate change isn't, it's not just about the the weather or atmospheric physics or something, it really affects everything that we do. And, um, and everything that we do affects the climate. It's a sort of in interactive thing. And that's why when you look at the IPCC reports, we do cover every single area of human activity. And in the last, in the last report in AR5, we actually had an Oxford philosopher on our author team was looking at sort of equity issues and things like that. So we really cover everything. And as Imelda says, it's every, you know, whether it's the way we live, travel, our diets, our, our, our leisure activities, everything is, is there and then climate has an impact on it and how we run those things also impacts the climate. So there's, there's a endless possible stories that can be, can be written. Absolutely. Like I say, you can make a career out of this, folks. Um, we have a question from Carolina gil -Posse. Uh Jonathan, uh, can you tell us what resources will be launched in Spanish? For instance, will the press release executive summary, will these be in Spanish and when will they come out? That's obviously be very helpful for uh, yeah. Spanish speaking. Well, the thing that will be available in Spanish and, and indeed the other official UN languages is the press release that will be, we'll have that at the launch of the press conference. We won't, it won't, it will be worked on, the translation will be finalized during the embargo period. So you'd have to work with the English version during the embargo. Um, the summary for policymakers will be translated as well. We always do that, but that won't. That takes a bit of time. It, it will take a, probably a few weeks or months anyway. In the world of the IPCC, the the professional translators, you know, they produce something, and then the scientists, um, you know, will look at it and say, well, actually, we would express that slightly differently. So we often get into a bit of a, a discussion, which uh, makes the process a bit longer than than is ideal. But we we get there in the end. So again. Summary for policymakers within a few weeks or months in every official UN language. And um, I think we will also fairly quickly um, translate the slides into, into some other languages, the slides used for the presentations to help authors and bureau members or governments who are doing their own presentations of the IPC report in different countries. So we will, we will do that. Um, as well, but again, it's not. It won't. They, it won't be available on on day one. It will, it will take a little bit of time. Um, we have a question as as to whether there are any opportunities for younger and aspiring journalists, perhaps under thirty years old, to engage with the IPCC report or climate change reportage in general. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I will say, uh, Jonathan. I'll, I'll let you talk in a minute. Uh, I, this is a good question. I mean, uh, on behalf of the Earth Journalism Network, we are trying, I, I can't confirm this yet, but we are trying to set up a kind of virtual uh, 
briefing reports that will come out of the climate cop in November from Glasgow. Uh, we'd like to do kind of daily, maybe one hour press briefings or panels from the cop that would be, and, and we're hoping they can be geared towards younger reporters. This is all very preliminary, so I probably shouldn't talk about it, but it's something we'd like to do. And uh, please stay tuned. Look, check out our website, earthjournalism.net, our newsletters or our, our social media feeds. If, if we can put this on, uh, we really hope to, to provide some resources and materials for younger journalists. Jonathan, did you want to say anything or? Yeah, I mean, first, that, that sounds very interesting what you were yeah. talking about. So keep us informed about that. Maybe we can we can work together on that. Yeah. And we already do a lot of work where we we try to reach out to young people in different countries or, or virtually. We do a lot of briefings for young people. And absolutely, there's, there are opportunities for, for young young journalists as well. And we, we hope to see more of that. And remember that, you know, journalism is a rapidly evolving and changing Thing as well it's, it's not just long wait, weighty thoughtful articles in newspapers I don't, you don't need me to tell you that there can be short little um, video clips and sort of things like TikTok which can be very effective at, at communicating and that's something which young people can, can be particularly good at. Absolutely a lot more on social media these days. Uh, here's an interesting question uh, from the host of the Sustain 267 podcast. Is there somewhere where we can get the full list of IPCC contributors. This, this person particularly is looking for African contributors so, so that journalists can know who to contact for interviews in the region. Yeah, so again, it's on our, on our, on our website. Um, there's, with every, with, for each report, there's the list of authors for the report and that lists their, their names, their institutions and their country. In fact, the country they work in and their their citizenship. So if you're looking for, say, African authors, you could find them there. When, when I finish answering, I'll drop a few links into the into the chat so you can find those more more easily. And I think also on our website, you can look generally as a database of authors. But the, the list of authors for each report is the most useful resource there. But I'll, I'll pop that in in a second. Um, I we have some more questions. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll you know, we're almost at the hour mark, so we'll probably wrap up soon. Get in your questions now. Um, I think we'll we'll ask Jonathan before we wrap up to go through kind of the uh, list of events leading up to the launch of the report, so that you, you can all be reminded of what will happen when when the press conference will be. Jonathan, I had a question about chapter eleven. I think that you said mentioned this is a new chapter about weather and extreme climate events. Is this going to be focusing on the science of attribution? This is a kind of exciting new yeah. endeavor in climate science. Yeah. yeah, yeah. go ahead. Absolutely. So this is a really cutting edge era of science. Science has been a lot of progress made. Um, and, um, you know, as, as Arnaldo was saying, we've moved on now from when scientists used to say you can't attribute any one event to climate change. Now you can, they, they sort of move beyond that to saying climate change is stacking the odds in favor of these events, but now we can start to quantify it and say something like this, there's a, a X percent chance more, more likely of this happening or something that, that would once have been, once a decade is now tw you know, every two years. So there's a, there's a um, and not only is that science more precise, the growing certainty, it's a lot faster as well. So in the in the past, it took quite some time for the for the scientists to come to understanding that. Now they can get there within day, days or week, or within weeks, and sometimes even days. So it's a very um, it's an exciting area of science, yeah. and one that really everyone relates to. Yeah, and really important for journalists too, because it can make your stories much more kind of hard hitting when you can say more definitively definitively with scientific support that these events are being caused to a certain extent, to a certain percentage by climate change. So um, I'm a bit worried we may have lost Jonathan. Is uh, Jonathan, you still there? Um, he may have some bandwidth issues, but we'll carry on here. Um, we're actually gonna wrap up pretty soon, but Imelda, Jose, do you have any final comments you'd like to say before we close? 
Melody, you wanted to start? Yeah, uh, James, um, I just want to uh, just to tell journalists that uh, it's really important to understand the science uh, behind climate change, of course, to increase uh, the quality of our coverage and uh, at the same time, raise public awareness and uh, increase pressure on governments to take uh, substantive action. Thank you, Imelda. Jose, any final words? Yeah, I would, I would just say that um, there, there, there is a lot of information uh, regarding regions, uh, a lot of regional information in the assessment report. And uh, we've, uh, we've been doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of work in order to distill all that information and prepare the, those regional fact sheets that uh, Jonathan was mentioning as part of the embargo material just to, to present the main findings in different regions at the continental level uh, in order to facilitate a bit this, this uh, digestion of all the information. So I would encourage the, the all journalists to go there and check that information. I hope we'll be, we will be able to finalize by the embargo date. We are, we, we are just uh, with the final, <laughs> it's the final work in many open fronts is a, is a lot of work, but uh, um, I would advise them to go there and start uh, start uh, looking at the, at the regional fact sheets. That's, yes. that's a good material. Thank you, Jose. That, the regional information will be so helpful again to journalists who are always looking to turn these global story, global issues into local stories. Yeah, I think we'll turn it over to Jonathan for a final wrap up. Maybe Jonathan, you could just briefly go over one more time the sequence of events leading up to the launch of the report. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, especially when when information will become available and when it will be embargoed until, please. And this is a question from Neil Kamal. Uh, Jonathan, yeah, you know, there you go. Um, yeah, look, look on, our, on, on our website or in the slides, uh, there was a link to it to the media advisory, which tells you how to register for the, uh, to get the embargoed materials and to follow the opening ceremony and the, the press conference. <clears throat> the, um, we'll be issuing an, an, another little media advisory um, in a couple of days, giving you the link for the, I think it'll be on our, probably be on our YouTube channel but giving you the link for the opening ceremony that's on the coming Monday when the when the meeting starts and that will be speeches by uh, the VIP the chair of the IPCC the heads of the WMO and UNEP and of the UNEP C. so it gives you already some material to kick the, the story off with then um, also look for the media advisory and book book your interviews for after the press conference and then if you've registered for the embargoed materials, we, we don't know for sure when the meeting ends, but sometime late, late on Friday, 6th of August, or might run, probably will run into the weekend, sometime on Saturday. If you've registered, you'll get the links to the, the press release in English and the summary for policymakers and the other materials we discussed. So you can start to prepare your stories there. And um, then the the uh, press conference uh, will be on Monday, um, the um, the 9th uh, of August at uh, 10, 10 o'clock. So the opening ceremony is at 11 o'clock Geneva time. The press conference is at 10 o'clock. Uh, you'll better again follow follow the press conference anyway on on YouTube and Facebook. But we'll, we'll issue an advisory with the links to that. But if you want to ask questions, there'll be details of how you can interact with, with that. And then after the press conference, which lasts about an hour or so, there'll be an opportunity to um, have interviews with the authors. Let's say you can already request those now. We'll start to process those um, next week. You can choose, we have a list of all the authors there and their, their nationality and their languages and their, um, their um, specializations. So you can choose, request them to with a particular author or you can express an interest in an author with a particular area of expertise or language or region, and we'll, we'll match you up with, with those. And then for sure, in the, in the coming weeks and months, there'll be more coming out about this as we present the report. And we'll be doing a lot when we get to 
COP26, whether that's um, in person or virtual, we'll be doing a lot of detailed presentations of the report then um, as well, to basically also to support the negotiators who will be working closely with the report in their, in their negotiations. So that's it. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for that summary. We'll be seeing a lot more of you, I think, in the coming weeks. And uh, thanks to all our panelists, Imelda, Jose as well, for sharing all this information. A um, few, a couple of final announcements. Just remember, as you've seen in the chat, if you want to travel to Glasgow to cover the COP, we we think it's there's still good, there's going to be in person coverage of it. You can apply for a fellowship from the Earth Journalism Network. Uh, look on our website, EarthJournalism.net. We have climate change media partnership uh, fellowships available. Uh, you have to apply before the end of the month, and. Uh, a special thanks also to our colleagues at the UN Foundation for supporting this webinar and look out for the next webinar, which will be held most likely on August 12th, a few days after the release of the report. It'll be a chance to ask questions for some of the authors we hope to have speaking at the webinar and to dive more deeply into the information to ask questions that you might not have been able to find answers to just by looking through the report. So thank you again to all of you for joining us today. It's exciting days as we, 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 start, we expect to hear a lot more about the scientific basis of climate change. And uh, stay tuned and keep on reporting. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.